I'm I'm a little surprised with that this chapter is as short as it is, and um, really I think doesn't give much attention to the nonprofit sector. And, and frankly, it's one of the things the authors say nonprofit agencies uh, are suffering from was the fact that well, people want want them to be the agency that provides social services for individuals, but really don't want to give them much attention in terms of their needs or anything like that. I I, I might be a little sensitive to this. I've I've worked in a nonprofit sector and uh, many of my my friends in the field work in the nonprofit sector and indeed as as a as a public employee with with uh, OCS and other public organizations like in in the children's home in Orlando where I worked for years we relied upon the private nonprofit sector to provide a lot of services for our clients and it just surprises me that that um, it doesn't seem to have as much of the author's interest, um, or more of it at least, than it does. But um, in any event, that's the way it is. This this uh, lecture might be a little shorter than usual. Um, please hold the applause till the end, b just because of the fact that there's a little less material in here than than I really expected there to be. But in any event, this uh, here we're talking about social welfare services in the voluntary sector. Um, Last week, we looked at the corporate sector, which was the fi the private for-profit organizations. And um, when really we, we the authors refer to this as the voluntary sector, it almost sounds like, you know, this is all about people doing uh, good deeds and, and, you know, just uh, providing services as volunteers. And that's, th this is, re they're really addressing the nonprofit sector. And there are fees associated with many of the services and many of those organizations because that's how the organizations fund their services. But the difference between the for profit organizations, which allows the organization to collect resources and get and make profit on the services through their business model. Um, the nonprofit sector generally is characterized by tax exempt status. So they, uh, because of the fact that they, instead of creating profit uh, by providing services and perhaps charging for those services or, or by getting donations to provide those services, um, they don't, they don't uh, make profits. If there is more money after, at least, you know, the nonprofits that are run properly, if there is money left over after services have been provided, that money is funneled back into the agency in one way or another to improve services. Uh, that might also include, you know, pay raises and things for staff, of course, but, but in any event, um, the, nobody walks away with profit from the from the nonprofit sector, in theory, at least, if you're running the organization. Now, it is also true that the CEOs of some of the larger nonprofit organizations make a very handsome income, and so you might question whether or not there isn't profit being made there. But uh, in any event, that's that's the difference here between between a, the what they refer to as the voluntary sector. I just wish they called it the nonprofit sector. It'd be a little clearer to me about what they're trying to talk about. But in any event. I didn't write the book. I should stop complaining and just go on and share some of the information that that they give us here. Private nonprofit organizations are indeed the heart of the voluntary sector in social services. So um, the funding funding sources come from and I, they're they're missing a few things here. I think, but you know, they talk about philanthropical. Uh, donations and when I hear about phil philanthropy, I guess I'm not thinking about my little deduction out of my paycheck for United Way or something like that. You know, which many of us do. Um, w when I hear philanthropy, I think about you know Bill and Melinda Gates and you know Warren Buffett and these people who contribute you know millions or at least hundreds of thousands of dollars and that kind of thing. Um, but philanthropy is one way that agencies get money. Um, individual contributions and um, uh, people just make outright donations. Sometimes uh, these organizations will have fundraiser like golfing tournaments or you know bake sales literally or car washes and things like that in order to raise funds for certain services. Uh, oftentimes for specific services for a particular client population. 
Uh, and then government contracts and grants, which for many of the, I think the longer term, more stable nonprofits, that is, um, it's really the source of much of their, much of their income, and, and they're very dependent upon that. So, uh, th these are not entirely free of governmental uh, involvement. The mental health agencies and the, as I've, I've mentioned this earlier the, in other lectures, that the mental health agencies and the agencies for the developmentally delayed in Alaska are all private nonprofit organizations that receive funds from from the state. Uh, and I think, you know, depending upon how creative their, their um, administration is, grants from, from other sources, such, you know, foundations and, and governmental organizations. But rather than, than the state government having offices to provide mental health services by state employees um, and offices providing services for developmentally disabled individuals by state employees, they, they contract out with private providers the providers hire the individuals and provide the services. So unlike, for instance, child protection, which is, at least in Alaska, at least in Alaska is entirely state-run, state-administered with state employees. Now, you know, in some states around the United States, uh, if not the investigation, at least um, the ongoing supervision of families and foster homes um, when children are in the home or with families, uh, foster families, oftentimes is administered by um, a private agency rather than the state agency. You have uh, private nonprofits providing those services as well, and there are some issues with that. But but uh, nonetheless, that's the that's the model that some states use. Um, I, I have to laugh if you um, if you have your text in front of you. Look on page one hundred and thirty-two. Uh, figure 6.1 and I'm not entirely sure how this where this is referred to in the reading I don't really see it re uh, referred anywhere but I have to kind of laugh because it says it's entitled the dynamics of structural interests and so they have the private sector that has human service executives running the organizations with private practitioners and voluntary providers and then there's the public sector, which is, you know, slightly larger. And, and inside of that, just welfare bureaucrats. And it, it kind of makes me laugh because we tend to think of bureaucrats in a negative, you know, in a negative uh, sense. And I trust the authors think, uh, don't think of it that way. Maybe they do, and they're making a comment there. But uh, again, as somebody who's spent many years working in public agencies, rest assured that quality social services of many different kinds are provided by almost all of the employees in any public agency. And I would venture to say that private nonprofits have, have, have uh, employees who, uh, if, if public employees are, you know, kind of sitting around with their feet up on the desk, and I've never met any that do, um, you can rest assured that that's happening in private nonprofit and for-profit or organizations as well, at least when the bosses aren't looking. But in any event, uh, you know, in addition to the funding sources here, I think they don't mention the United Way, and United Way is a significant funding source for many, particularly the smaller nonprofits, um, those that are out there constantly looking for additional funds and and those kinds of things. And and we'll touch on the United Way a little later on, um, and perhaps perhaps that they're talking about the United Way as a part of in individual contributions. Okay. So, because the fact that government funding has been shrinking, I mean, you know, the the um, social services, as as the authors mentioned, I think in in chapter one, you know, social services, you know, there's an increasingly conservative kind of a a look at at, at social services over the last several years, and so um, funding has been shrinking um, as far as governmental intervention is concerned, and it said that. Funding is is uh, in some respects shifting to the the uh, private sector, whether it be pri uh, whether it be pr for profit or non profit. So anyway, more demands being placed on the voluntary sector to meet social welfare needs, and while this, this certainly wasn't a new thought in the Reagan administration, uh, little by little, uh, the country was shifting to more conservative politics after the 
social welfare state of the New Deal and the Great Society have had their heyday. Uh, Nixon, as I think the text points out, Nixon was was more socially liberal than um, the traditional conservatives are today. So it seems kind of contradictory to say that uh, our, that uh, a conservative could be socially liberal, but but as the text pointed out here, I think in what well, might have been chapter one even that you know that the traditional conservatives and the cultural conservatives really see things very differently. But it was with Reagan when cultural conservatism began to become more popular, connected more to religion and things like this, and much more focused upon getting the federal government out of social services. Um, at the end of his time, uh, George H. W. Bush was was elected president, and and uh, it was his vice president. And while he had a, I think probably a bit of a softer approach to social services than than the Reagan administration seemed to have, um, he still focused upon m many of the same politics. And he, during his uh, acceptance speech at the National Republican National Convention in 1998. His, he talked about the thousand points of light, which was you know what America was to be all about. You know volunteerism, and that's what he was talking about. And 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 uh, Bill Clinton, even as a Democrat, you know he uh, he was enough of a politician to understand that uh, liberal politics wasn't going to get him elected. I mean, arch liberal at least wasn't going to get him elected. And, and so he really hewed very closely to the, to the center of conservatives and liberalism to try to, try to be um, attractive to both sides. But uh, his campaign promise was to end welfare as we know it. And, and um, um, Indeed, you know, with the passage of the welfare reforms, although I think that was um, shaped a lot by the Republican Congress as much as it was by him. I think it was harsher than he had in mind at the time. Uh, at least when he signed it, he said it was much harsher than he wanted it to be. But uh, he, he did announce that the era of big government is over and with, with the signing of that act. And um, during the George W. Bush administration, who followed, he followed Bill Clinton. You know, his his campaign was all about compassionate conservatism. Even though he was a Republican and he was a conservative, he he wanted to make sure that the needs of the of the impoverished and the dispossessed were taken care of. And so, uh, his focus while he was in the office, although he. You know, he really kind of lost interest in this pretty quickly, but his focus was upon faith-based social services and, and, and created an office, I believe, of faith-based social services, which, incidentally, Barack Obama continued um, during his presidency. And again, uh, something like Bill Clinton, uh, but perhaps more so with the exception of the first two years, I think the Democrats were in control of both houses of Congress when after Obama was elected. Uh, for the most part, he, he faced a Congress that was very resistant. Um, that the, They were uh, dedicated to making him a one-term president, and when they failed to do that, they they just continued their resistance through, through all eight years. And so any progressive ideas he might have had really were tempered uh, a lot by the reality of having conservatives uh, voting up and down, his, his proposals up and down. And that's how we wound up with uh, something of the mess that the Affordable Care Act has been, an improvement over what we had, but, but not nearly what we need. So again, a brief history about the origins of, of the voluntary sector, you know, the charity, the, the uh, nonprofit agencies go back, connect back to the charity organization societies of the mid 1800s that uh, they had the friendly visitors, you know, dropping in on, on those who were needy and counseling them as to how they could improve their, their, their lifestyle it really wasn't about handing out money. It was, it was about providing services to fix people who were deemed to be, um, you know, less than adequate in, in, in their adjustment. In many respects, nonprofit organizations have that same sort of medical model approach to their clients. And I don't mean to say that in any kind of a demeaning way, but, uh, you know, m many of the nonprofits that we are familiar with that serve clients directly aren't really working on, on advocacy for change. Some are, but, but many of them are not, and, and they're really focused upon treating people um, and fixing the issues that they have. Now, the Settlement House Movement, which was more of the reform 
um, organization also has you know some of the nonprofits are, are uh, social advocates and social reform um, oriented and and uh, their their involvement uh, you know can be traced back to the settlement house movement which which came arrived on our shores somewhere in the late 1800s around the turn of the last century community chests were forming you know people wanted to, you know that just kind of coordinate donations uh, during the 1800s and and uh, if you ever played Monopoly you know about the community chest you know and that's what that was all about and that that uh, kind of evolved into the United Way which is a national organization but but the United Way chapters are, are locally administered and run so the United National Organization has more of an oversight uh, and and uh, a support role I suppose for the local chapters it doesn't it doesn't uh, as I understand, at least, doesn't boss them around or tell them how to do things or what they can and can't do. Um, the local chapters, I'm sure, have to subscribe to some sort of a code of ethics in order to qualify as United Way agencies but, or United Way chapters. But but beyond that, they're self they're self um, self directed. So United Way gathers is is sort of the one campaign that in in most of the communities that campaigns for donations and like I said earlier oftentimes you know employers support the United Way or have supported them in the past they may have changed I uh, I'm kind of reading from the book um, but by making direct don direct withdrawals from persons uh, um, paychecks you know I remember campaigns you know always having a United Way coordinator in the office and it when I worked for the state you know every year to encourage us to donate something to the United Way and all of this money then is gathered and and then this uh, local board of, of uh, overseers or directors or whatever then uh, considers all the applications from the private organizations in town which who which have to spell out what they want to do with the money I mean they have to justify the money and then they make decisions based upon how much they gather and and what the requests are how, how those funds are distributed and as I said many of the smaller agencies in the community those that are kind of starved for for funding depend very much on United Way contributions so it's a, a noble uh, a noble cause now the text refers to the fact that there have been some scandals in the national administration of the United Way. You know, it's really impacted their their um, their donations. You know, and and hopefully it will outgrow that eventually. You know, because uh, unless you have a cor a corrupt group of people running it locally, and that's highly unlikely. Um, you know, the United Way does good things in your community. Um, we talked about the Milford Conference Report, which really kind of defined how how uh, social casework agencies are supposed to fit in and respond to the community. And, and even today, it, it, mental health agencies and DD agencies, those organizations I talked about, that uh, d domestic violence agencies, these agencies all have boards of directors that are populated by people from the community who are, you know, supposedly make decisions about who runs the agency and what the policies of that organization is going to be. And they all have bylaws that dictate how long they can be on the board and who's supposed to be on the board and all that. And so this is still the community representation, the input into these organizations still very much comes from the community. And, and, and that comes in large part from, from this uh, Milford Conference in the 1920s. The text doesn't mention the American Red Cross, but I added them here as another very large voluntary agency, as you're aware of it. It, it gets engaged in uh, disasters and, and, and such. Re Herbert Hoover, in fact, relied very heavily upon the American Red Cross during the Depression. He became the president of the American Red Cross. In fact, they appreciated his reliance upon them so much that they made him their president. The resources of the American Red Cross, as, Red Cross as the Depression went on, you know, became depleted very much, and that and other organizations organizations couldn't just couldn't continue to uh, take care of the needs that that were arising after the depression or during the depression and so that's when the federal government uh, assumed really the the largest role in our history in social welfare during with the new deal and uh, when, when when times get tough and the middle class and the upper classes are affected by uh, by tough economic times, it seems as though all of a sudden we want government to take care of us. You know, that doesn't last very long, but, uh, it, you know, if it, it affects the, uh, if it affects the upper classes per, um, personally, they're much more, uh, much more inclined to approve of social services. 
And so the New Deal was put in place uh, with some ups and downs during the uh, administration of Franklin Roosevelt. And as I said, you know, with some uh, modifications and uh, reductions here and there and, and uh, amplifications here and there, really those many of those programs continued uh, up until the time of the Reagan administration when, and, and continue today, of course, Social Security and um, you know, a lot of the maternal and child health programs and, and uh, SSI all kind of grow out of, uh, of the New Deal. So it isn't to say that uh, the New Deal is dead because it's, it still exists and is a very important part of our life. But many of the programs that were there kind of been, you know, set aside since. And many of our presidents has tried very hard to dismantle what's left of it. So the purpose of the voluntary sector is to advocate uh, for and to serve the population of individuals who are needy but who do not meet the eligibility requirements for government programs. And as the author says, or who don't represent a profit for the, the commercial uh, for-profit vendors. I, again, you know, sometimes they make me chuckle a little bit. You can kind of get their idea, an idea of what they think about uh, some of the uh, matters of, of way social services are provided. Uh, but uh, our culture expects that those that are not in the mainstream are going to advocate for themselves and stand up for themselves and, you know, get the services they need by talking to their legislators and, and those kinds of things. And, it, you know, if you've done that, you know, it doesn't quite work quite as easily as, as we think it's supposed to. There's no assurance of success. Much of the um, political process seems to be distorted very much by by lobbyists and and uh, the the influence that the these powerful lobbies have on on our representatives and and uh, you know the individual voice is um, I think in many respects is overshadowed by the by the interests of the of the lobbyists that and the great lobbies that help fund their campaigns of course and keep them in office. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, the voluntary sector is supposed to be taking care of all these needs that aren't funded or taken care of by the government. But uh, it's it's a very big job, and, and they can't really do it very effectively. Um, in some of the agencies, two of the agency types that are mentioned in the text that, that are often, I mean, just on the verge of collapse oftentimes, you know, because of funding issues are domestic violence shelters and, and homeless shelters. And in a patriarchal society, um, and, and in a patriarchy where funding is run oftentimes by males and uh, political processes are, are, you know, are managed by males by and large, not always, of course, women are becoming more prominent, but, but in our patriarchal society, domestic violence shelters aren't always seen as a, a, a you know, a charming presence in the community, and it should be. And I think progressive and forward-thinking males recognize that. But, but there are a lot of backroom interests that that uh, really don't like funding uh, violence against women acts and things like that. Likewise, with the homeless, as as you know, this is the, this is the. Uh, I mean, their their economic situation is so bad they don't even really reach the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder in most sociology textbooks. They're, they're considered, uh, you know, the, sort of the outcasts of our society and, and uh, nobody knows what to do about the homeless. Well, we know what to do about the homeless, but, but the public doesn't want to get behind it. And so these organizations often struggle to get the funding they need to, um, you know, provide the services that are needed. And they're very, very dis, uh, deserving of, of funding because the, the services they provide are extremely vital. And um, so, uh, and, and, and mind you also, domestic violence shelters, women's shelters, and um, homeless shelters, the staff of those facilities are often on the cutting edge of social advocacy for their clients. and. Um, and for social change, and so they're they're great organizations to work for if if you have a social advocacy bent to your to your view of the profession. But understand that 
the money you're going to make and and I know that you know we don't think about money so much when you know when we're thinking about you know doing good for the world but the but the fact is that's a reality we all have to deal with and and uh, the the salaries you're going to earn in, in those kinds of agencies are going to be the social advocacy agencies are going to be lower because well you know the public just doesn't want to fund people uh, agencies and persons who stir up the pot and who uh, disturb the status quo. And these two types of organizations do that and do it very effectively. United Way, on the, on the other hand, now United Way will fund homeless shelters and, and uh, domestic violence shelters and, and, and programs. So, I mean, it's not that United Way doesn't connect to them at all, but uh, United Way has, uh, as the author says, funding, funding priorities consonant with the needs of the clientele that is more highly regarded in the community. That says a lot, doesn't it? <clears throat> now, um, the United Way, uh, well, it it, it uh, does a good job of, of distributing funds all around and one of the things that it does then is is to uh, encourage everybody to d donate through their organization and when nonprofits in the community engage in fundraising activities separate from the United Way you know that's um, not always viewed favorably by United Way and, and, uh, and sometimes those organizations do their own fundraising um, you know won't won't get grants from the United Way for that for that reason. And when it comes to public policy debates and and uh, social research and things like that, you know, voluntary organizations, just nonprofits, they're just really not much considered in any of that. But um, but you know, when when uh, officials want to reduce federal investment in social welfare programming, this is where they turn. Um, and. Uh, talk about how efficient they are and, and, and how effective they, their services are as compared to those lazy bureaucrats that don't really know what they're doing in the public sector, you know, and, and uh, who who just more interested in getting the next pay raise rather than taking care of their clients. And, you know, um, so a, a good example, it's, it's kind of referenced in the text, but it doesn't really talk about, you know, the, the um, Republican takeover of Congress, I think in the the first midterm election in the Clinton administration, and Newt Gingrich was was uh, elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. And I, I mentioned this earlier: the contract with America, which really imposed arch or proposed arch conservative solutions to issues about public, uh, you know, public dependency and and uh, was really kind of mean spirited stuff, but uh, was quite popular for um, quite a while. It's something that the Clinton administration had to struggle with and is one of the reasons why um, some of the uh, reforms that were enacted during the Clinton administration, such as the um, welfare reform program and the Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the Defense of Marriage Act, all of those things uh, came across uh, pretty um, pretty not democratic, not very liberal, and and uh, Clinton uh, has said since, you know, that he, he really was pushed uh, into into those positions, signing those bills into law because he knew that Congress would would um, uh, override any vetoes he had of, the of that harsh legislation, and uh, things could have gotten worse, and it makes a lot of sense when you look at the bigger picture, but in any event... Um, Voluntary organizations was the answer to a lot of the stuff trying to get government out of out of human human services, and there are about a hundred thousand nonprofits uh, in in human services, the HSOs, uh, I think they're referred to, that generate about two hundred billion dollars in contributions in a year. But that's uh, only about one eighth of all charitable contributions, even though human service organizations represent about a third of voluntary organizations that receive donations. So, you know, what other kinds of, of uh, if it's not human services organizations, I mean, the voluntary uh, voluntary organizations include things like, you know, uh, the arts and the culture, humanities, education, uh, health agencies, although I would consider them personally human services agencies, uh, international aid, uh, you know, religion related, religion related kinds of organizations, that kind of thing. And again, many of them are are also engaged in in uh, nonprofit services. So, so uh, although they get about an eighth of the contributions, they they really do represent about a third of the 
ages uh, of the organizations involved. And most of those most of those nonprofits are really quite small. What what contributions come in, and this is one of the reasons, one of the problems that nonprofit the nonprofit sector has, is that what contributions come in. Uh, you know, vary with with prosperity, and it's interesting. You know what what the, the text points out um, that uh, taxpayers with in after the between 2006 and 2012, and again, you know the the Great Recession occurred late in 2008, so sort of not exactly in the middle, but kind of in the middle of that period, and so for the few years surrounding that that uh, economic debacle. Um, Taxpayers with income greater than two hundred thousand dollars decreased their donations during those years by, you know, about four and a half percent. Whereas, taxpayers with income less than a hundred thousand dollars increased their donations by about the same amount. That's very interesting. Uh, much of the capital in in uh, in um, well, in any human services organization, public, private, pro for profit, or whatever, but much of the capital in um, Nonprofits as human capital, volunteer hours, uh, for instance, in 2013 equated to 4.8 million full-time employees, or about 163 billion dollars worth of services. So these these are volunteers. Again, there's a lot of paid employees in these organizations, but but the volunteers are a very big part of of this of this sector. The authors think there's little doubt that philanthropy will expand significantly during the 21st century. I, I can't tell you that I share their optimism, but they may know something I don't know. Uh, but as they point out, that one of the big questions is, what are we going to do if that wealth is there? What are we going to do with this wonderful wealth that we have? And are we going to use it to amplify our moral citizenship? Or are we going to, you know, allow it to be, you know, just, just wasted? So, so uh, private organizations in, in uh, advancing social justice uh, have they the voluntary sector has been the source of, of this movement, growing back to the settlement house movement of the, around the turn of the last century, and um, will oftentimes take on concerns that doesn't have broad support uh, in the community. So, government programs won't, um, you know, won't um, pick up the mantle and, and pay for services, and so oftentimes the nonprofit sector then will pick up and advocate for, uh, I would call them dispossessed populations. Um, and, and also, again, the, the, the uh, areas, the groups that don't attract the interests of the business community, you know, and the business community, again, you know, the for-profit area, it's profit, it's the, that's the bottom line. So a former uh, health and education and welfare, now HHS um, secretary, John Gardner said that virtually every far-reaching social change in our history has come up from the private sector, and and he listed a number of them in the text, you know, including uh, you know the abolition of slavery, uh, populist reforms around the turn of the last century, which really kind of led into the progressive era of the uh, first 20 years or so of the last century, child labor laws, uh, the vote for women, and and uh, improvement in women's rights uh, in in the workplace and other places, civil rights of, of uh, both women and, you know, racial minorities and other other groups. All these, in, including now, you know, the LGBTQ uh, community and the advocacy for their for their causes. Is, all of this has really kind of risen up out of the of the private nonprofit sector, not from not from government actions. Now, interestingly. It was pointed out to me one time by one of my students many years ago, been in the military. I find this to be true in some respects that the military, um, when it's being run, uh, typically at least, is often on the cutting edge of, of uh, social change. You know, so for instance, you know, Harry Truman segregated the, uh, the, the uh, military units after World War II. Uh, ahead of the time when segregation was becoming codified in law. Um, there, the the uh, there's been you know, the efforts to uh, to uh, allow uh, gays and lesbians in military units. That's also been something that you know is kind of pushing the envelope of of the uh, willingness of the public to accept changes such as that. Uh, women in in uh, combat, those kinds of things. Women in the military. These are these are changes that that uh, oftentimes uh, you find the military 
thus government uh, in the forefront of change, although maybe reluctantly so. Also, very important organizations in, in, uh, that advocate for social justice uh, have arisen from and continue to exist in the form of nonprofits like NAACP, the AFL-CIO, which is you know the big uh, union organization, uh, civil rights movement, uh, National Organization for Women and Services for Battered Women and Homeless and AIDS Patients and those kinds of things. They refer to bourgeois philanthropy and elite philanthropy, you know, that I think most of what, uh, you know, we do and what these uh, these smaller nonprofits and even the larger nonprofit social service agencies get funded through bourgeois, relatively small middle class donations. And, um, but, but the elite donations, uh, they have much uh, more far reaching goals. Um, include things like, well, Ted Turner has mentioned that he gave a billion dollars to the United Nations. I don't remember that, but it was back in the 90s, I think. Um, the, we all hear about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And if you turn on PBS, you know, you see all the different kinds of foundations, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and which is, you know, and the Casey Foundation, the Casey Family Foundation are two organizations that are heavily involved in in advocacy for uh, foster children and uh, child abuse and neglect programs and things like that. Um, Warren Buffett, you know, is a billionaire and, and, a, and, and a socially liberal billionaire who actually advocates for uh, much higher taxes for the wealthy that would include himself. Uh, Buffett uh, donated six billion to the Gates Foundation and, and Gates and Buffett together challenged wealthy Americans to, uh, to commit half of their wealth to philanthropic causes. Um, 69 families signed up by 2011 now. I, I just checked this out um, on the web. It said 187 families around the world have signed this pledge since. So, you know, there's a lot more wealthy families out there, but some of them are doing it. The Patients Assistance Foundation, where major pharmaceutical companies uh, promise to provide aid to indigent uh, Americans who need help with their medications. Um, the least they can do, in my opinion, but that's another story. So, you know, most Americans say they want voluntary social services. They don't want the government providing services, you know, but, but uh, um, the, the, the ability of this sector to be able to provide those services, it's, it's really pretty questionable that they're going to be able to live up to those expectations. And there are, there are some transformations going on. The text points out um, you know, like commercialization, um, that uh, you know the nonprofits have to compete with the for profits, and they use some of their own tactics, including um, you know engaging bill collectors in chasing people who have not paid the bill, even though they get you know tax breaks for accepting charity cases. Uh, um, and and um, hospitals, I think the Obama administration, I think it says the Obama administration implemented a program under the ACA that has hospitals reviewed uh, that the, the Charity hospitals or whatever the nonprofit hospitals reviewed every three years for their compliance with uh, practices that are suitable, you know, for taking care of of these individuals. That's good. Um, and also, you know, engaging, you know, buying businesses, you know, to make money, and and that was challenged by the for-profit sector. F felt that it was unfair competition, and so uh, as I think the text points out, the courts ruled that. Uh, Businesses, I mean, nonprofits could do this only if the business related directly to the services they provided. So, now that doesn't mean they can't have fundraisers, but this is talking about actually, you know, businesses. Uh, Faith-based services. Uh, the issue for this this um, this particular segment of the uh, the private sector is is that they can. Uh, because of the fact that they are, you know, uh, religious organizations run by religious organizations, they have the right to uh, implement hiring policies that enforce their religious beliefs. Uh, um, you know, there's uh, cases, uh, for instance, you know, of, uh, of um, a woman who's been married to another woman for 12 years in, in a high school, a Catholic high school in Indiana. And uh, the administration found out about it and is letting her go and she's suing them for that. Well, you know, it uh, same-sex marriage isn't accepted in the Catholic Church and so they, they maintain because she signed an agreement that she would live by the precepts of the church if she was going to teach, 
you know, children, that kind of thing. And so that's the kind of thing uh, Catholic Social Services in Anchorage was uh, would not do uh, home studies for same-sex couples. Uh, for for the same reason, I think. Well, for something of the same reason, at least you know. So I mean, their religious organizations have the have the ability to do that, which denies services uh, to you know a segment of the population that often needs it. So, uh, and and it, it can also um, require individuals, you know, when accepting services or help from them to participate in you know some of their religious. Um, services and things like that. Uh, finally, uh, social entrepreneurship is mentioned and uh, you know this is about investing in social capital and uh, it was you know kind of a vague notion to me but but I mean you know it's it, it's it's an area where maybe some ideas new ideas are going to come up and they claim to be flexible and innovative these organizations and and accountable much more so than organizations that are funded you know and stay funded and you know, and even if the services are no longer needed. So, Michael Bloomberg, uh, former mayor of New York, can, uh, you know, has thought about running for president as an independent in the past, is more recently has thought about running for president as a Democratic candidate, and he, he is a billionaire. He has uh, invested a lot of his money in, um, social causes around the globe, not just in New York or in the United States, but around the globe, including things like, uh, I think, uh, cutting or smoking, quitting smoking reduction, you know, smoking reduction, whatever, gun control, things like that. And he says that he believes f philanthropy, and he seems to practice this, that philanthropy should embolden government. And this suggests to me that he thinks that some of these things can be achieved through government intervention, but uh, the big issues really need to be addressed by government, and and uh, that maybe social nonprofit agencies can't do, you know, such as things like gun control and global warming and reduction of obesity and quitting smoking and disease um, elimination, that kind of thing. So, I don't know. You know, on the one hand, uh, we we believe that the major social changes have come up out of nonprofits and out of the voluntary sector. But uh, the funding for that really depends upon a very few number of people who, you know, have a lot of money. And so wouldn't it be good if a government could begin to devote some of its own resources to, to these things? Well, that's it. Um, like I said, I, I think more could be said about the nonprofit sector than, than is said here. But uh, I, I think they're a pretty large segment of the population. I, I think you'll find more nonprofits out there providing social services than for profits. Now that landscape may change, but, but that's how I think it is at the present time. And so um, anyway, I hope the information was helpful to you. And if you've got questions, as always, please let me know.